to discuss the explainability of tertiary based models. Uh, explainability is a subject that is uh, in the bigger area of responsible AI, where we are trying to understand how artificial models are working and how they're building their decision making, decision -making processes. Um, so to introduce to you a little bit our um, session content for today. So we are going to talk first about why we care about explainable AI and how this works. Then we will move to the perturbation-based models for attention-based explainability in the project report of the on-call assistant use case. First things first, why explainable AI? Why do we care about explainability? So explainability is the process of being able to understand and also in very plain words explain how a machine learning model is behaving in a way that is intuitive and understandable to humans. So here we have two types of explanations. We have the so-called local explanations and global explanations. So local explanations are um, intended to understand and explain why a single decision was made, while global explanation aims at explaining how the model overall is behaving and how it arrives at its decisions. Why do we care about explainability? First thing is trust. How is it that we can trust our ML models if we cannot explain or understand how they are behaving? So we need to build the trust in the way that the decision-making process involved in the model um, is first ethical and also uh, understandable so that we can trust that the decision is made in the right way. The second point is transparency. So it's important that when uh, we are in some sensitive subjects and uh, also in general for um, troubleshooting that we understand and we are transparent about the process that the model is using in order to come to a certain decision, we want to be fair as well and uh, understand if we are not missing a dot in our model to also have the accountability because now that machines will start making decisions instead of humans, uh, we need to have this accountability, which is a major part of all ethical considerations. And which means that we are capable of being accountable for our decisions and also being able to explain and um, give reports of how we led to this decision. And the final thing, which is more of engineering uh, directed, is the troubleshooting. Because if we cannot understand what are the flows of a model and why it is deciding uh, to give us a certain uh, result, then we cannot troubleshoot the right way. So one of the applications from uh, science and engineering perspectives that is typically interesting to scientists and engineers is the troubleshooting part that we can also der derive from, from, from explainability. And this is what we will explain more in details um, through the on-call assistant uh, use case. So the fundamental idea or concept behind um, explainability is the idea of information consistency. So I can give you some uh, examples in molecules where I can give you the mass, the size, the charge, and many physical and chemical factors about molecules, but this is not enough to explain what is a molecule of water, because for water, we really need to have a certain consistency, consistency in, the, in the information in order to move from some disparate parts to something that makes sense and that brings a molecule uh, that we know about and that, that we can use. And this is the fundamental idea behind explainability, which means that we are trying to move uh, to a class abstraction of our um, smaller parts in order to move to an idea or an information that a human can understand. Let me drive you through a concrete example of that. Supposing we have developed um, a model, uh, a deep learning model that is complex, black box, for example, we have went for a GRU model, um, so we can have some text generators that can help us understand uh, the number of parameters in this model, uh, the number of uh, weights that were used in order to train this model. Uh, but this is not, and we can visualize even these weights, as you can see in the picture on the right, and see how these layers and how the embedded layers look like. But this does not help us understand how a model is making a decision, because this stays at the granular way of information that is not giving us the consistency that you need. So we need something like this instead, something where we have a certain graph or a certain understanding to humans, where we can say that, yes, uh, we decided that um, uh, the pajama or elephant in my pajamas is referring to a humorous reading rather than uh, a real uh, elephant 
who is wearing a pajama, for example. In that sense, we need to have this consistency of information where we are moving from some disparate parts to have this abstraction of the model and understand its different parts and how they lead to something understandable to humans. So how does it work? Um, so in our context and the context of the projects I will be uh, showing you is that we have a goal for finding some simpler models that can explain an original complex model, which is more of a black box model, which means that we cannot know what the model is behaving, what it is doing and how it is reacting because we are in the area of deep learning, we are in the area of uh, neurons interacting with each other, so we are not capable of understanding how um, these models are building the consistency of information. So we want to go for a perturbation based approach and what perturbation means is that we are going to partitionate our input into many super pixels. So our input will be divided in different parts and then we will start turning on and off randomly some of these pixels and seeing how this would impact our output. So the point here is that we are looking for a feature attribution, which means that we are discovering how every one of these pixels that were perturbated could impact our output or how every one of these is important in defining every part of the output. Basically here we are in the context of local explainability, so which means that we are trying to explain individual decisions of the model. In a post hoc analysis after the model is developed, which means that we are applying uh, this explainability buffer after a model is developed in order to understand um, how it was behaving, how it was de deciding not on the go. So let me walk you through some general and, um, and um, models used in literature for local explainability uh, to uh, the approximation of complicated model by a more interpretable one or a model that is easier um, on, uh, the, on the local time. So let me walk you through this picture here. We can have a picture that is describing the Newton's canon and then we can um, use the Newtonian physics in order to understand how in local environments, uh, our approximation that there is no curvature in Earth in the computation of trajectory holds true. While if we want to go further, for example, if we want to be throwing something from one point on the Earth to the other point after a curvature, so we see that the model of linear linearity, which is the easy model of not taking into consideration the curvature does not hold true. So here we have the example of a complicated model um, in which the computation of the trajectory should be done in a certain way that takes into consideration the spheric uh, volume of the earth. But when we are looking at it on local um, environments, we see that it, is, it can be interpretable by a certain segment or a certain continuous um, trajectory without taking into consideration the curvature. And this is where Lime lies on. So Lime's objective is that we can bring a local explanation by approximating some local decisions with a simple linear model, while this model would not hold true for the whole, um, the whole uh, set, because you are going to, to, to go in the area of the complexity of the model, the general model, but in local environments, we are capable of optimizing um, uh, a complicated concept through uh, an approximation that is correct on local and that is more simple because here we are going to uh, only use trajectories um, through a normal distance without uh, taking into cons consideration the spheric uh, volume. So this is an example of how this works, which means that we are perturbating on local and trying to approximate a complicated problem in global locally by some simpler models that can be interpretable. Another technique that is used and that we could use as well um, on the understanding of how parts of the input are interacting with each other uh, is the sharp values. So sharp values is um, first directing us to the notion of coalition. So what we are looking at is given that we have different parts of the input, we want to know how these inputs could play with each other and how every one of these inputs could drive its importance out of the group through building different types of coalitions. So for example, we have different players, we have different people working in a team, we have an account manager, a solutions architect and a technical account manager. And every one of these can have a separate payout if he's taken alone. But then if we have coalitions, we will start to understand how um, 
there, how these uh, people play together in order to come to a certain equilibrium. And in that sense, the question that we ask after that is how can we separate payouts uh, by players? And in that sense, we may have many solutions, right? Some obvious solutions could be giving equal payout to everyone, which means that we are going to give everyone the same amount of payouts, but this is not fair, obviously, for the high performing players. Another solution could be to have something more proportional uh, by players. And this could be a good solution, actually, better than the previous one. But the problem is that it could discourage the team play. And so uh, it will not um, uh, help them play together and form these coalitions. So the solutions in these cases are using the Shapley values, uh, which were proposed by Shapley that you can see in the picture, and who uh, is using game theory in the context of cooperative in-person games in order to be able to distribute a payout among many players while uh, driving them to work together and to um, drive the work together. And for example, between uh, two players that have each 100K and 40K um, and the sum of 160K if they play together, we are going, for example, through uh, Chapley values uh, deduce that 110 would go to player A and 50 would go to player B. In that sense, we are not giving neither um, an equal pay, uh, nor um, a proportional pay, but we are driving this from game theory in order to come to a Nash equilibrium, where we are going to give to every one of these its payouts. And this is practically important when we are trying to analyze uh, situations where we have different inputs interacting with each other in producing an output. And then we want to start um, deciding which one of these inputs contributed to, where, to what in the output. And we can use game theory to solve these issues. Now, let me walk you through the perturbation strategies. We have introduced this in the beginning, and I want to first explain to you what perturbation is. It's a very intuitive idea, um, and um, it is applicable in uh, events of uh, explainability and in um, responsible AI. And then I will walk you through a practical case where you can see in industry environments, how is it that we can apply these perturbation strategies. Uh, so perturbation is, as I mentioned to you, a very intuitive uh, concept. We have an input, then we are going to take this input and take part of it that we are going to perturbate. And in that sense, after we have perturbated part of this input, we will measure the impact it has on the output through a quantitative metric that we will define. And in that sense, our point of comparison is to compare cases where we have not perturbated anything with cases where we have perturbated parts of the input. And doing so, we can understand how this part of the input is contribution to the coalitions of other parts and how we can um, decide about the importance of every one of these parts using uh, game theory um, as um, a conclusive, uh, conclusive way. So perturbation was used in literature for different data types. Um, if you want to use perturbation for images, for example, we can think of occlusions. So we can have an image, then we are going to start uh, making occlusions on different parts of this image. For example, uh, making a, if you have a face, for example, we are going to hide the nose, hide the mouth, hide the eyes, and then see how these perturbations could impact our outputs and measure this impact or this difference that we see. Um, perturbations in uh, tabular data can be done through LIME. LIME is this model that is trying to approximate black box complex model in local um, environments through more interpretable one because we are getting locally and we can have better approximations. Perturbating videos, for example, could be done through the application of some temporal masks. Uh, so we can, for example, uh, start freezing the images in a video or reversing these, these images in the same video and making so we are making perturbations on different parts or chunks in the video and measuring the impact on the output that's understanding which part was important in defining our output. We can also think of perturbations in the context of reinforcement learning entities where we can start perturbating the rewards of our reinforcement learning agents. And in that sense, um, getting a better understanding of how every one of these rewards would contribute to the final decision. Um, after we have applied these perturbations, the way we represent this is through saliency maps. So in saliency maps, 
we are going to take every part of the input and measure the impact of perturbating it on the final output we can see. You can see in the first picture we have here that we have a nine and we see that in the nine we have some parts of the picture that are important, which means that when we are perturbating them, we are seeing high impacts on the output. This is basically true for uh, the central uh, part in the image where we see that it is red and also in the bottom because it's easy to confuse the nine with the two. And this is why if we start perturbating the part in the bottom, we are likely to get a two rather than a nine. And this is why it has a big importance. This is also applicable in cases of language and this is our new direction for this uh, presentation. So I'm going to talk about natural language processing applications. And in natural language processing, we have some models called attention-based models. Uh, attention-based models are simply models that use context in order to distribute the importance over the input tokens while taking into consideration an attention mechanism that uh, takes uh, the context in order to predict a final decision. So for example, here we have an example of a translation from English to French, and we see that the word good is being translated into bon rather than bon because both translations are possible from English to French. But here we are taking into consideration the context in order to understand if our word is referring to a man or a woman and thus uh, translating accordingly. And in that sense, this is an example where we have an attention based model that also used um, some saliency maps in order to represent the importance of every one of these pixels in the input, which here represent words simply. Uh, and their impact on every part of the output, and thus measuring the importance um, of um, and which words were key in this translation uh, for what we get for the output. Now, I have a question for you, um, which of course you not answer now, but just to think of it is how is it that we can start perturbating texts? So we can have a text. Here we have an example, which is when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. This is an example of a text. So how is it that we can perturbate it? You can think of it two seconds, then I will walk you through some examples of perturbating a text through, for example, a naive approach. So in this naive approach, what we will be doing to perturbate this text is applying masks. So you see that every one of these words, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade, was replaced by a mask. And now we have lost the information for the word. And this is a naive way of perturbating a text. The same applies here for the second um, text that we see. If we are to teach the real piece in the world, and if we are to carry on real war against war, we shall have to begin with the children. And we see that a way to perturbate this text is to apply some masks on words. And of course, here, our granularity or the granularity we are interested in is words granularity. It can well be that we are interested in a sentence granularity, in which case we can start perturbating sentences instead of words. There are other types of perturbations where we are applying drastic perturbations as well, is, for example, applying some character substitution, where we are replacing some characters in our text by some random words in our keyboard. And this gives us uh, a perturbated text. So for example, here we have the you must be the change you wish to see in the world. And then when you start perturbating it, you see that we are creating words that do not even exist in the dictionary. For example, you have the must here instead of must. And we can generate uh, many uh, substitutions. There are some uh, libraries that can help us do that through an LPO from Hugging Face that can help us create new words. And in that sense, you see that in either the first case or the second case, we are perturbating text in a way that is drastic because the words that we are getting afterwards do not exist in the dictionary. So they cannot have a translation and they cannot be embedded the right way after that. And the same applies for the first naive approach because we are totally um, deleting some words so we can no longer have them in our sentence. And these are examples of drastic perturbations. Now we can also have more gradual perturbations, which means that we are applying perturbations, but they are more gradual. They're not that drastic to totally delete the information or create words that do not exist in the dictionary. And here we have an example of uh, gradual perturbations to synonym substitution, which means that we are automatically uh, replacing words by their synonyms. And here we have 
the famous an apple a day keeps the doctor away. We are looking for synonyms and then we see that it can be an apple a day keeps the doctor by or an apple a 24 hour interval keeps the medical away. So here we see that we are replacing words by other words, but these words are more of synonyms or meaning the same thing here. The word day was replaced automatically by 24 hour interval, which is the same actually. And the medical here is uh, actually just the translation of doctor and it refers to the same thing. We can also make some gradual perturbations uh, in the sense of apply some paraphrases, which means that instead of saying something, we can try to automatically say it another way. And this is another example for you must be the change you wish to see in the word being translated through the bird um, paraphraser to something like you must be the change that you shall wish to see in the civilized world. Okay, so the idea is there, but we have changed um, the text. We have not changed it in a drastic way that would totally delete the information or create something absolutely new, but we have changed it slightly through a paraphrase to your experience must be, the, must be the change you wish to actually see in the spirit word, for example. And here we can play on the types of perturbations that we want to apply to text. So now I think that this answers the question that I asked you previously on how we can perturbate text. And we can see that actually perturbating a text is not something neutral or binary. We can perturbate it in gradual or in dra drastic ways. So in drastic ways to even deleting the, 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 the word or the sentence or uh, creating something that does not exist in the dictionary or creating some problems. And we can also do it in a gradual way, which means that you are just replacing by synonyms or paraphrases and then seeing how this would impact uh, our final output. And we can also um, think of other ways for perturbating, like creating keyboards in order to understand if someone made, made the keyboard, how this would impact our final output. So let's be back to um, our perturbation for explainability. Um, perturbation, as we could understand, can have can be done in a spectrum, uh, which means be from gradual to drastic. But then we have two limits in the way we can perturbate text. Our perturbation can be either uh, leading us to the so-called out of distribution generation, which means that we are in cases where we are moving from um, one topic to something totally different, like moving from talking about software to talking about global climate change and so on. Um, there is also this, uh, this issue that is the other limit, which means that we are not really perturbating enough to capture importance, but we are only perturbating to assess the robustness of the model. And these are the two limits that you'll see right now in the project report. So in the project report, it is a natural language processing model. Uh, that is used by um, the so-called on-call teams. So on-call teams are teams in a company that are responsible for uh, solving issues that the customers can have while using some tools. Uh, so um, these people will receive a ticket which would describe the problem that the customer is facing. Uh, let's say that I'm using a certain tool, I'm using a web page every day and now it's blocked and I cannot refresh it. So what I would do is just writing um, a ticket or raising a ticket and then sending it to uh, the responsible team, which is the uncle team, who would look at this ticket and say, ah, yes, uh, they have this problem, then probably should figure out how to solve it. They would dive deep, find a solution, solve it and fix it, and the client is happy. Um, so the point is that the business used before the uncle assistant to do this in a manual way, which means that whenever there is a new ticket, they would dive into it and try to look for the solution in that independent way from what happened before. Now, the uncle assistant is an intelligent tool that is based on deep learning that would collect the new ticket, which means the new problem that the customer is facing and compare it with the historical closed tickets. Closed tickets means tickets that were already closed, finished, solved and fixed. So we are going to take this historical data we have from the past and combine it with the new open ticket that we get. And the objective is to provide these engineers with the three closest tickets from the past. So we are providing these engineers with uh, the three closest solutions as well that they can use in order to solve this ticket. Uh, so in that sense, if we want to modelize this from a natural language perspective, we will have first to encode our tickets using a deep learning attention-based encoder. Uh, some examples of these encoders could be BERS or GPT, for example. 
And then what you do is through this encoder, we are going to collect um, the embedded layers, which means the encoded parts, uh, and uh, collect the transformation that we get from moving from a word uh, to a vector. Word is translated to a vector of 768 dimensions. And then we are going to find the encoding of a text. So we, we are transforming the text to a vector. And the text, which is, for example, uh, five sentences um, length, will be a vector of 768 dimension because it's just the average of all the words that are composing these texts. And in that sense, the objective for this encoding is that we are moving from a text, something that humans can understand, to something that is more um, numerical, which is just encoded vectors. And this, this part is a black box part, which means that we cannot understand how uh, we are getting this vector instead of another vector and why uh, we are getting this exact uh, encoding. Then after we have encoded the vectors, uh, so our texts are now vectors, we are going to use some similarity uh, tools like uh, bar tree algorithms or cosine similarity in order to find the nearest neighbors or now the nearest vectors to every one of these texts. And this would give us the recommendation that we drive to our kind customers. So the challenges that we were facing is that we are in an unsupervised type of problem. So we did not have any quantitative metrics to evaluate and um, troubleshoot the model. This was the first problem. And then we did not have explainability in terms of plain text, plain words or sentences uh, from the business to provide a text-based explainability of our outputs. So our objective from the perturbation-based explainability is first to troubleshoot the model and improve it. And the second part is to provide interpretability in terms of plain text to our business. How does this work? So we have our new open ticket, which is our text composed by different sentences. We are going to, divide, to give this text to the on-call assistant and the on-call assistant will bring us three recommendations. These are the closest problems from the past, right? Then we are going to divide our text to different sentences. It can also be words depending on the granularity that is required. So we are going to take the first sentence alone and we are going to perturbate it. Now we know that we can perturbate sentences in different ways. This would give us a perturbated sentence number one. So in, that, in this case, sentences from two to n were not perturbated and sentence one was perturbated. After we have perturbated sentence one alone, we are going to concatenate sentence one with the other non-perturbated sentences from two to n. And this would give us a perturbated text number one where only the first sentence is perturbated and all the others are not. We are going to give this perturbated text to the on-call assistant in order to drive the new recommendations or the new solutions that we get. And at this point, we, we will compare. So we'll compare the results we get when we did not apply any perturbation with the results we get when we have perturbated sentence number one. And this would give us the perturbation impact of sentence number one. Next step is reiterating. So after we have applied this to sentence number one, we are going to apply this to all sentences, be able to compute the perturbation impact of every one of these sentences and rank the sentences by their perturbation impact, which would give us a ranking of sentences by the importance score they have. So our results is given that we can have a ticket. This is an example of a ticket that we can have. Uh, so the ticket starts with some repetitive sentences, what is happening and ends by expect an answer from engineering team within two business days. And then we have a description of the problem or the bug that the customer is using. So after perturbation, we see that the first and the fourth sentences were the most important sentences in defining the nearest neighbors. And we see that actually in the nearest neighbors that we suggested to our tickets, we have the repetition of sentences number one and number four, which means that we always have what is happening and expect an answer from engineering team within two business days. This means that these sentences were considered by the algorithm as being important sentences while they were not. And this helps us travel through, through for example, deleting repetitive patterns. So uh, results for drastic and gradual changes are not the same. So drastic uh, perturbations help us, um, help us drive a notion of importance of, of uh, sentences in, the, in their relationship with the output, while gradual perturbations help us assess the, 
uh, robustness of our model, because if you replace a word by a synonym, we should not expect the model to behave totally differently and then bring another output. So this can help us assess how our model is sensitive to keyboard errors, for example, or to paraphrases and synonyms, in which case we can play on uh, the robustness correction. Outcomes and practical tips. So the outcomes of our um, a practical case application of perturbations is that we actually succeeded in troubleshooting the alcohol assistance for different uh, use cases where we discovered some unnecessary repetitive patterns. And we could then provide an explainability to our business in simple ways because now we are able to tell them that in your original text, there were three sentences that were the most important in defining the final output, and these sentences were, were X, Y, and Z. Um, the technical tips that we can provide from this is that perturbation methods can be generalizable to all deep learning methods, which means that they are model agnostic and they can just be used uh, ad hoc after we have uh, we, we have uh, we have developed our model. Um, we also uh, suggest that explainability could be used for um, with drastic changes and drastic perturbations, while we can study the robustness of a model through gradual changes and key borders and that we can combine this perturbation analysis with what we can see on the learning layers, which means the neuron layers of a deep learning model in order to also be able to understand the neurons learning. So that was it for my presentation and on explainability, responsible AI, and also uh, the project report. Now it's time for your questions. I'd be happy to uh, answer these before going to the breakout sessions. Thank you very much, uh, dear Selsen for this very interesting and very informative uh, talk. I myself work on XAI, explainability AI techniques, but for images for computer vision. So I learned a lot on this application on NLP. So yeah, as you said, the uh, time for questions and uh, we did receive a lot of questions. Let's say most of them are more on the explainable AI in general, and also some of them are on the specifics on the uh, on-call um, system you developed at Amazon. So let me start maybe by the more general questions. So um, the first qu the first question is the following. Thanks for the talk, uh, dear Selson. What are the limits of Lime and Chat? Do they work in a large scale production environment with high dimensional categorical features? Yes. Um, so the limit of Lime is so Lime and Chat are different um, types of models that are applied to. Um, they are all used for local explainable, which means that we are trying to explain one decision making one decision made for by an algorithm, but they are applied differently in the sense that Chat would try to understand the coalition between the features and try to see uh, how these features rank uh, as compared to each other and um, which, which characteristic in our input was important in defining the output. So let's say, for example, we are trying to forecast um, the price of um, um, a house, for example, and we have different criteria. We have um, the, 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 surf, the surface of our, uh, our house. We can have, for example, the, the possibility of having uh, pets or not. We can have um, the, the district where our house is. And on this basis, you want to make an estimation of the price of this house. And um, the objective of SHAP would be to uh, help us with game theory in order to start um, deleting and turning randomly some of these features iteratively through forming some coalitions. So we are going, for example, to form a coalition between the price and um, and um, and the, the the fact that pets are 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 allowed, for example, and then we see and we we turn random the other feature uh, of the surface of our house, and then we are going to see how the impact was when we are trying this experiment. We can also, for example, do the same, but um, applying it to the sur to, to um, the, the pets instead of the surface, for example. In that sense, we are creating coalitions and we are then using game theory in order to come to the Nash equilibrium uh, that would help us give to every one of these features or every one of these characteristics um, one uh, value or one importance in the total payout. So this is the application of SHAP. Uh, in order to explain um, ex explain decisions when we have some multiple players. Uh, in the case of text, for example, we can use it in 
in um, in cases of we have of different sentences that we have or different words that we have and then we want to understand how these words also play with each other after we have discovered their marginal um, their marginal contribution to the overall payout now when talking about line specifically line is based on the idea that if we can approximate uh, the model on a certain area then we are capable of uh, getting uh, a simpler model that can explain this. If you remember the example for the Newton physics, where we have the sphere, and then if our trajectory is very is very big, which means that we are making the whole round on the sphere, then uh, the trajectory would be portrayed by a certain spheric curve. While if we are at local um, at a local uh, distance and we are really uh, looking locally at this, so we can have an approximation through a normal linear model because this curvature will not have that big impact. And the point behind line is that you are trying to, on some specific and local um, uh, local uh, local environment means that in in certain in certain areas of the data to try to start having some simpler models that are explainable and that can approximate. The limits would be on how we can start moving from locals to something more general, which means that we cannot, we can have different explainabilities or different models uh, that more accurately explain every local environment. So there is a limit to generalize. And um, this is uh, this could be applied actually to even uh, multidimensional models where we are trying as well to see if some projections into a linear model could help uh, have a better understanding, but this cannot generalize to the whole model, which means that we are then locally focusing on some areas of the data. I hope this answers the first question. Yeah, th thank you, uh, dear Sassan. Yeah, uh, I'll ask you probably another question, which is related because I see that you, you already started giving an, uh, an answer to that. So the question is, um, is there any specific perturbation-based methods that suits uh, tabular data? Uh -huh. uh, so for tabular data, Lime is probably the perturbation approach that is the most um, the most uh, used in uh, literature. Uh, but then we can uh, we can use the, the uh, importance features, for example, which is based on randomly turning on and off some features in order to perturbate in them and combine this with a sharp uh, theory in order to understand after we have computed the individual marginal payout of every one of these features, how these could could, could make uh, coalitions informing the final, um, let's say, game theory equilibrium of marginal payout. Uh, but Lance says, says in the literature review, I made um, the most used uh, used area. Why, in for example, uh, images, because you were talking about computer vision, we can have other tools uh, for occlusion, for reversion, depending on whether we have videos or we have images, and where the objective for perturbations would be to start turning on and off um, some pixels and super pixels of the picture mm -hmm. and start to see how this could impact uh, the final output we can see. And the question is how should we uh, set the size as well of these super pixels? So there is some fine tuning work to do on the go um, to, to achieve um, like um, an optimal stage. Um, thanks again. Um, the next question is about hyperparameters. So for example, for Lime or SHAP, for Lyme, you can have like the neighborhood, the, the size of the neighborhood, etc. Are there other hyperparameters for um, for perturbation-based methods? Um, yes. Uh, so you have uh, talked about the, the size of the local environment that we are looking at, but there is also this hyperparameter of what um, interpretable models we are targeting as well as part of the explainability interpreter. So in which um, in which um, function set we are looking for our interpretable model. And this would be, for example, uh, going for a linear regression model to approximate a deep learning model on certain local places. But the choice itself of the linear regression model could also be enhanced by also enhancing this with the random forest model where we can have a random tree or a tree-based explainability of our model. So this is another parameter of which uh, is our next target on local basis. Okay, so now we'll, we'll move to more, um, more questions on the on-call uh, system. So the first question is, uh, could you please give more det details on the recommendation comparator in the perturbator model module? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the question is about the on-call assistant, right? So yeah, on the recommendation comparator. Uh -huh, yes, uh, so um, the objective of the comparator is, is that we are having some historical tickets, which means that we have had some historical problems in the past one year, for example, that were already solved and closed. 
And in these problems, we will have some indicators of who solved the problem, for example, and the root codes, because some people write some questions that can give us indicators of what root codes were behind this problem that occurred, or what solution they used to actually solve it and close it. So we can have some useful documentation in cases that were already solved from the past. Now, when we are having a new problem, um, we uh, can have the possibility of diving deep into this problem, but most probably this problem occurred in the past. So there is a POC we can be reaching out to to solve it more rapidly, or there is an indication of solution and root cause that we can find in already existing models. So the objective of the recommendation system is to start from this ticket that we have, and then uh, we are going to encode it uh, using attention-based models. And in that sense, we can think of BERT or GPT as some, um, some attention-based models, which actually play a bigger role in, um, in helping have the clustering um, conversions. Because if we go for TF idea for some uh, vocabulary uh, directed models, we may not have the convergence of the clustering and we may not see the structure because we cannot capture enough the complexity of the language. So we are obliged at times to go for attention-based models. And let's say that we use BERT or GPTR for that. Now BERT would be um, uh, help if we take BERT, it can be used for classification, but what interests us is the latent um, representation of the vectors. Since before it goes to classification, it would have encoded our text to a certain vector that is 768, for example, dimensions. And this vector we are interested in, and actually we can retrain BERT and fine tune it on uh, some data specific topics in order to have it fine tuned with our data. But at the end of the day, we are getting a vector out of our text, and we are also getting vectors out of all historical texts. And um, the expertise is how we can try to have uh, a good representation of this vector. And this is also the black box aspect of it, because you cannot know why we got this vector rather than this other vector. And we cannot explain it in plain words, because this is more complicated. And in that sense, after we have got the vectors, we have some algorithms um, to capture the proximity with other vectors from the past. So our texts are now vectors. And then we can use, for example, the ball tree algorithm, which will try to find some clusters and some trees in our data, and then look for the nearest neighbors in the smallest cluster. Um, and in that sense, we are getting three nearest neighbors. But again, we are in an unsupervised type of task, so we cannot know if this was the right answer to give, and we don't even know if there is a, 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 an actual right answer to give, because probably there was no, um, no ticket from the past. But there are ways to tackle this problem, because we can have distance measure. And even if we do not have um, it's not like, for example, uh, a percentage where you know that 95% is good and the uh, 50% is not great. So now we are getting distance and this does not mean a lot, but we can try to drive some statistical significance of this distance to looking at the average distances that we can see with on average for random tickets and try to, to drive some statistical uh, comparison because the between the distance that we are seeing and the distance that we see on average. And in that sense, we can have um, uh, a loop that can say uh, if if, we, if, our, if our nearest neighbors were good enough or not, as compared to average uh, random. And in that sense, after we have uh, passed this loop, so we can either success or have success or fail in this, uh, in this situation. If we succeed, then we have the recommendations that we can drive with a good uh, type of precision. But if we do not succeed and our distance is, let's say, 100, while we have a distance of 300 random, we know that our nearest neighbors are not good at all. And in that sense, we can be back to our learning mechanism to see if there is a way we can encode our vectors in another way. If there's a way we can change the way we are to use, for example, a combination of GPT and TF-IDF instead of only using BERT, for example, and then see how we can uh, redo our learning from different scenarios that we had defined in order to come to the new recommendations. And in that sense, after we have brought these recommendations, we know that from text A, I could, take, I could have text X, Y, and Z, but I cannot know why which sentence in text A led me to having X, Y, and Z, led me to have X, for example. And so in that sense, I will start perturbating the sentences. Let's say the simplest perturbation is deleting the first sentence and then seeing if my X, Y, and Z would change or would say the same, because if I remove altogether the first sentence and I still have X, Y, and Z, then I know that for X, Y, and Z, the first sentence would not the key elements, but it would be for uh, cases where the sentence would have a good impact. And in that sense, we are going to start ranking the impact and start using some game theory to give the uh, marginal payout to every one of these sentences. Mm. Thank you. I see, see a lot of questions, but yeah, for the sake of time, I will just take like two, two last questions. 
One of them is related to this first question. It's about actually the distance you use when you compare the recommendations, when you perturbate and then take um, the nearest neighbors without perturbation, you, you said that you are, you are comparing both recommendations. So what kind of distances are you using? This is a fair question. And this is a case specific question because depending on the case that you are studying, you need to define the, the own quantitative metrics. So in our case, we are looking for three nearest neighbors. So we can have two, this, two types of distances. The first distance is how many nearest neighbors would change. So this would be a number between zero and three, either the three of them changed or nothing changed. This is one metric. Mm -hmm. of time. The second metric is given that we have defined the nearest neighbors X, Y, and Z before perturbation, we were close to X by one distance, for example, to Y, we were close, for example, by two, and to, to, to Z, we were close by three, given that X is the closest and Y and Z are the furthest. So we have distance one, two, and three. Now that we have perturbated the first sentence, we are going to recompute uh, the distances to these same nearest neighbors. So after we have perturbated sentence number one, we were further from X by one, but now we are further by three. So we know that the impact of um, of this, um, this perturbation on sentence one was that we are getting two um, difference from X. So we are going in that sense to, to compare um, the, the, the first case where we have not perturbated anything and we had some initial distances to our nearest neighbors with cases where, where we have perturbation and we are getting furthest from our nearest neighbors, but we want to quantify um, to what extent we are getting furthest, uh, further and uh, have uh, an average or if what we care about the most is the first nearest neighbor, then we can rely on the change in the distance for the first nearest neighbor between the case where it was not perturbated and when it is perturbated. And of course, this is very specific to a case where we are looking for nearest neighbors. Now, if we want to apply it to other cases, we can think of more appropriate uh, metrics to the case itself. But in our case, these were the most uh, appropriate ones for um, the three nearest neighbors. All right, thank you. Um, and last question, um, since you presented uh, in the beginning of your presentation, Lime and CHAP, and then you went to um, present a perturbation um, based techniques, did you use them in your work or what was actually the idea behind using perturbation based techniques um, instead of the other uh, type of explainable AI techniques? Yes, uh, so line was just to, to explain that we can start making perturbations on different local areas, which means that we can start partitioning our data on different data sets and trying to locally try to understand the key um, drivers of some decision making processes. It was not used as such uh, through the localization because we have uh, we do not have we are not approximating a regression model or a classification model through a more uh, a simpler model, but we use this notion of local perturbations. Now for SHAP, it was actually used because after we have computed the impacts of every one of these perturbations, we will need, for example, we have perturbated sentence number one, two, and three, and the impact of perturbation for every one of these sentences was three, four, five. Then we need to, to see how uh, things work when we keep sentence one and sentence three, sentence two, and then sentence one, and start building some um, payouts which are individual to every one of these sentences. And this in this case, we use the um, Shapley values. Thank you very much, um, dear Sosan. Again, uh, really sorry because we have more questions, but we cannot take them all. And that's why it's, uh, I invite you actually to join the breakout session to stay with us and, uh, and ask all your other questions that you could not actually um, ask here. Um, so yeah, thank you a lot. Thank you a lot, dear, dear Sosan uh, Ademi. So now we stop the live streaming and then go back for the breakout session. Okay.